Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Hey guys. Okay. I like this painting, isn't it good? Brings me joy. I don't know why, it just does. So that's going there. Okay. Hello everyone. If you are new to the channel, hello, my name is Connor. I like to learn about history through YouTube recommendations. Love for you to join us, uh, hit all the buttons, subscribe, like, dislike, whatever. Um, and uh, the original link to the video will be at the top of the description below. Right below that will be the link to the Discord. Just click on that. It'll send you right over to, our, to the uh, Discord. Join the family. Love to have you. Pull up a chair. The more the merrier. Let's do it. Hope you guys are doing well. If not, well, that's that's not good. You'll be good soon, though. Don't worry. Emotions are fickle. Let's go. If you're not ready to learn, get out. This video is brought to you by Curiosity Stream. Get 31 days of streaming completely free using the link curiositystream.com slash Fiji. Is this stream. like the emu or war? You can wait till the end to hear more. Toyotas? Hello and welcome back to Featurette. Because you weren't expecting that, were you? Me to start a series and actually continue it. But based on the reception to my last video on cars, you were all very, very disappointed. I didn't talk about technicals and specifically the Toyota Hilux. So what better way to make amends than do a whole video on Toyotas, highlighting the great Toyota war. And then you guys can repay the favor by helping me pay the bills. Yeah, sick. So to set the scene of the Toyota war, we're gonna have to set the scene. It's the 60s and Africa has just recently been split from its European colonizers. And with all great changes in history, it's accompanied by a lot of violence. All the new nations were finding their footing and civil wars, coups and rebellions were everywhere. So it would be in 1969 that the now notorious and now also dead dictator Muammar Gaddafi would lead a coup in his home of Libya. Gaddafi came to power on... Did the U.S. kill him? Um, I don't know about that, but... Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya... USA doing great. ...an agenda of Arab nationalism, and it was fundamental to him that he took a stand for decolonization and also to secure strategic resources and political assets for his yeah, militaristic regime. These combined goals led to him pursuing claim on the Alzao Strip, a section of land on Libya's border with the former French colony and currently civil war ridden, Chad. Gaddafi's intervention in his southern neighbor's affairs started with him securing allegiance and supplying rebel groups against Chad's authoritarian president, Francois Tumbulbaye. However, he was soon able to enter negotiations and just straight up buy the Alzao Strip for 40 million pounds. It was a sizable area of land, but it was mostly desert with a small population that was concentrated in the town of Alzao. Its only attraction oh, cool was its rumored uranium deposits, but also its annexation just served as a fantastic display of Libyan prowess. So for three straight years, Libya fair and square owned the Alzao Strip. Up until in 1975, Francois Tumbalbaye was overthrown, and the rebel groups responsible were not fans of their former dictator's Libyan appeasement. Gaddafi would reopen hostilities and continue his support for Libyan friendly rebels against the new government. Across a series of interventions by the Libyan military directly and also a handful from France in support of Chad, a line would be drawn in 1983, separating government and rebel forces. Libya was left with virtual control of northern Chad. Now, the Libyan military far outclassed the poorly equipped Chadian militias. Libya was stocked with old Soviet aircraft, armor, and artillery, and held control over the admittedly few strategic garrisons in the Chadian Zahara. However, by 1987, the Libyans had lost the support of the local rebels, and so despite their resources, the Libyan defense consisted of isolated conscripts with low morale. The Chadian government, under the leadership of Hissini Habre, would be provided with 400 Toyota Hilux and Land Cruiser Utes, ready to be equipped with anti-tank guided missiles, light anti-air, heavy machine guns, and so on. 
The French had provided the Chadians the unconventional weapons, as well as pledging air support, all in hopes of seeing the Chadians reclaim the north from Libya. It may sound pretty weird that Chad's international support came in the form of civilian Toyotas, but improvising fighting vehicles wasn't an unfounded tactic. In fact, stretching the definition of a vehicle, you can point to First World War Russian Tachankas as an early example. Horse-drawn machine guns that were perfect for hit-and-run combat on the wide open Eastern Front. The British Commonwealth iterated on that in the Second World War, when they armed light jeeps with turrets for use in the long-range desert group, who saw great success in their North African raids. The historical tactic though falls apart in tough mountainous and jungle warfare, which was the bulk of most post-Second World War conflicts, that is, up until the 80s. So the Chadians would make the most of these Toyotas when they opened the offensive against Libya by striking the well-fortified communication base in Fada. Defended by 2,000 Libyans bolstered by armour and artillery, they were defeated by 5,000 men, French air support and some trusty Japanese Utes. After this success, they moved for Libya's airstrip, defended by even more armour, artillery, air force and even a minefield. French air support forced the Libyans to stay grounded and the Chadians discovered that when driving 100 km an hour, they didn't trigger the mines and could roll straight up to the airstrip. Wait, really? So, so the mines don't work just by a lot of pressure on it. Maybe it has to like, maybe there has to be pressure on it for more than maybe like a second or whatever, or half a second and maybe going around a hundred miles an hour or whatever it said would mean you wouldn't trigger it. Um, or maybe you would trigger it and be out of the way fast enough where it exploded. Another victory for the ragtag army. As soon as Harbre had secured Northern Chad in those few short months, he was ready to continue the initiative and take back the Alzao Strip. Now that was against the French's wishes and so now the Chadians moved without air support. They were able to take the town of Alzao, but when met with Libyan counterattacks, were forced to abandon it. These Toyota tactics just wouldn't work when it came to defending. So in September 2000, Chadians drove across the... Is, by the way, whoever, a lot of you recommended this video, but this is a cool video, not what I expected. Thank you. When it came to defending. So in September 2000, Chadians drove across the border into Libya, blacked out under moonlight, concealing themselves in the valleys and hills... In September... Of Libya. But in September 2000, Chadians... So the year two or 2000 Chadians or 2,000 trucks. Drove across the border into Libya. Blacked out under moonlight, concealing themselves in the valleys and hills, they made their way north of Libya's main airbase, Matan El Sara. Garrisoned by 2,500 men, over 70 tanks, 30 APCs, and around 30 aircraft, the Chadians were outnumbered and easily yeah. outgunned. But their raid came as such a surprise when they were spotted coming from the north it was believed to be reinforcements, and by the time it was realised they weren't, they had reached the airbase. The cars were too agile to be targeted accurately by aircraft, and were able to strafe and down tanks with surprising efficiency. Libyan casualties were between 1,000 and 1,700 men. All their vehicles were downed and their airstrips were torn up. The Chadians had lost 65 men and a few Toyotas. Good job, I mean... People died. Obviously, it's it's not good when people die, but I'm saying good job on the, um, the Chadian force without French support. They're very brave, obvi honest, obviously, and and going like a kind of Toyota Blitzkrieg, and doing that's that's very impressive. And um, you know, I don't know if it's the Raiders wow. left as soon as they had arrived, and the defeat was crushing to Gaddafi's military strongman image. It was then the dictator tried to save face and took a conciliatory outlook, signing a ceasefire and letting go of the Alzao Strip back to Chad, which was, in his words, his gift to Africa. The Chadian's underdog victory hit headlines in the West and it became known as the Great Toyota War. However, as we all know entering the 21st century, the use of Toyotas and other four-wheel drive utes in war would become very commonplace. 
the Somali civil war in the 90s saw the fall of their national. My favorite capital name of any country, Mogadishu. Such a cool sounding name. Very commonplace. The Somali civil war in the 90s saw the fall of their national army and armored vehicles became impossible to finance and run. And so the warlords and their factions quickly took to creating what became known as technicals. Using Toyotas and other brands of four-wheel drive utes, they would be kitted out- Sorry, so that chatty and army kind of, you see a lot of these, you know, pickup trucks with the, uh, you know, big gun on the back. Um, a lot in like North Africa and the Middle East. And so the Chadians sort of pioneered that uh, All the same strategy. guns used in the Chadians war. These cars became symbols of prestige for militias. And the same commander that had beaten back the US at the Battle of Mogadishu Muhammad Farah Adid was carried to his grave in the tray of a Toyota Land Cruiser. And Somalia is the reason we call these gun cars technicals. Non-governmental organizations working in the country couldn't bring in their own private security, and so using technical assistance grants, hired local militias for protection, and these Somali source security services just about always ran these vehicles. As the wars have continued to spring up in the open desert environments such as Iraq, Afghanistan, and Syria, the technicals appeared more and more. How do you get you across know, like the big sand, the, uh, sand dunes? And obviously, you know, there's not not everywhere is those giant like when you think of a desert, those giant sand dunes. But maybe they would like get thicker, wider tires, or maybe let some air out to create more surface area going over. Or maybe that wasn't necessary. I don't know. In Afghanistan, even the well-funded U.S. Special Forces oh, yeah. took to using the vehicles for recon operations. Afghanistan, Great. So many non-state militias and weak armed forces employed the use of technicals. The Islamic State had made a name for itself with its endless convoys of land cruisers. The vehicles, while not armoured and not designed for war, are designed perfectly for a budget. Their speed yeah. allows them to avoid unfavorable fights and respond quickly to where they're needed. They require no specialized training to drive. They're so much more fuel efficient compared to- So they're, so they're like the AK-47 of war vehicles. You know, like the AK-47, is, it's an extremely reliable gun and it doesn't take much to fire it and to know how to use it. Cheap. So yeah, this, this definitely makes sense that this would be a very important asset for a lot of countries. To a tank, and just about anyone with a spanner, two hands, and one functional brain can maintain them. So it's given all these reasons that they're now iconic in 21st century conflict, where war is closely what associated with desert combat and militia fighters. And that's why today, even modern armies are beginning to research and develop in hosting their own fleets of technical-like vehicles. Russia has begun production on its domestically- mm, the US. Okay. Fleets of technical-like vehicles. Russia has begun production on its domestically made UAZ Patriot, which is designed to drive like a Hilux, be reliable like a Hilux, and cost as much as a Hilux, just without the Toyota badge. I thought that was a satellite dish at and first, an interesting but it looked like a bazooka. Add, it is such an advantage to have your military rolling around on as least fuel as possible, especially when all the fire and German, destruction Germany is happening in the very II. oil fields you'd need to fuel your car. Oil is important in war, it's important to politics, and it's important in me segueing into this sponsor for Curiosity Stream. Because on Curiosity Stream, I was able to watch- It's the end of the video, I just want a lot of you I'll let it play out, but a lot of you are probably going to stop here. Awesome video. Thanks, thanks, guys. A lot of you recommending this. Cool video. I'll be back with another one soon. Hope you're all doing well. See you next time.